announcement that bilateral discussions between the Republic of Korea and Japan to resolve sensitive historical issues have concluded. We encourage the ROK and Japan to build on this step to continue to advance their bilateral relations. The Republic of Korea and Japan are two of our most important allies in the Indo-Pacific and globally, and stronger ties between them advance our own shared goals. The trilateral relationship between the United States, the ROK, and Japan is central to that shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region, which is why we have invested so much time and so much focus on this critical partnership. Specifically, we have had roughly 25 senior level trilateral engagements with Japan and the ROK over the course of this administration. This includes engagements from Secretary Blinken, Deputy Secretary Sherman, Special Representative for the DPRK, Sum Kim, and of course from President Biden himself. We look forward to continuing to strengthen our trilateral partnership to help bring about a safer and more prosperous world. With that, Matt. Great. <clears throat> Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Um, Two things first, really briefly. Do you have anything to add to the statement that uh, your White House colleague just read about the Americans uh, who've been kidnapped in Mexico? Uh, I will admit I, I didn't uh, see the full extent of, of her uh, own statement, but uh, I expect she noted that we're closely following uh, the kidnapping of four U.S. citizens in Matamoros uh, on March 3rd. Uh, the FBI working very closely um, with other federal partners and Mexican law enforcement agencies uh, to investigate this. I'm sure you saw the FBI put out a reward uh, for uh, their uh, safe uh, return. Uh, we're standing ready to provide all appropriate uh, consular assistance. We do also remind Americans about the existing travel guidance when it comes to this uh, particular part of Mexico. The travel advisory for uh, Tamaulipas State remains at level four. Do not travel. Uh, we encourage Americans to heed that heed that advice. Okay. So essentially, no, you don't have anything to add. But thank you. But do you? Glad, I'm always glad to hear there the was a, Well, there was, a, <laughs> there was a question about whether all four were U.S. citizens or not. I, has that been confirmed now? To your to your. We we are aware uh, of the kidnapping of four U.S. citizens. That's our understanding. Right. Um, uh, and then uh, separate from that, and going back to the secretary's trip, I just wanted to know, and I, I, I'm not really expecting anything here, but just a shot. In the, shot always, in the, always a good uh, approach. Shot, in the, yeah. shot in the dark here. I'm just yeah. wondering after his uh, ten minute or less than ten minute exchange with Foreign, min foreign Minister Lavrov, if there has been. Um, you know, any, any follow-up to that or, you know, any conversation at a, a notable level between <clears throat> you guys and the Russians, or if he left that exchange, that encounter, with the idea that there might be uh, in the near future? Well, we've always had the idea that we are prepared and ready to engage when our interests are implicated, when the interests of our partners and allies around the world are implicated. Uh, that's precisely why this wasn't the first conversation between Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Lavrov. It wasn't even the first since the start uh, of Russia's full-scale invasion uh, against Ukraine in February of last year. Well, it was the second. It was the second. It was the second. Two, but but, two, two but we, have, we have demonstrated, and two makes this a consistent pattern, but um, both in word and, and we've also made it clear, both in deed and we've made it clear in word, that uh, we are ready to engage uh, when it is in our interests to do so, when it's in the interests of our allies and partners around the world uh, to do so. The Secretary was clear about the three priorities that he raised with Foreign Minister Lavrov in that meeting. We've also been clear that we didn't, we wouldn't expect uh, one particular, one specific meeting with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, would lead to a resolution uh, of the issues that he raised, and that, of course, is putting it very mildly. We remain uh, prepared, ready uh, to engage. Uh, if it is in our interest, as you know, we do have lines of communication. We have an embassy in Moscow. The Russians have an embassy here. Uh, there are other channels uh, from within the State Department, from within uh, other uh, departments and entities within the executive branch. We are going to do, continue to do, what is most effective to advance our interests. We thought that last week, because Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, were in the same room, they were in the same place, uh, it was an opportunity for the Secretary to convey very directly, uh, without any room for mis misinterpretation, uh, the areas that matter a great deal to us. Uh, whether the Russians will, in turn, act on that in any way, uh, the jury is still out. Again, uh, we harbor no illusions that a single brief encounter uh, would 
uh, change their position, but it's important for us to advocate and to advocate effectively uh, for our interests. Sure. Has the Secretary seen the now infamous uh, clip on, on, on the social media in which Lavrov claims that the war was launched by the West against him, his country, and that he's out there to stop it? I was wondering, what, what was the Secretary's reaction? Was it reflecting the reaction that we have seen from the audience? I, I, I think, Alex, you, you can't watch that clip. You couldn't have been in the room and heard Foreign Minister Lavrov make those remarks and not to have the same reaction that apparently everyone else in that room had. Uh, for those who haven't seen the clip, the room breaks into uh, what can uh, be described as probably uproarious laughter uh, at a statement from Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, that Russia was attacked, and that was the genesis of uh, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We've heard similar statements, uh, outlandish statements like this uh, from Russia before. Um, I think it is clear from the reaction in that room, uh, the fact that uh, the world is uh, under no illusion about how this started, about who is responsible, and perhaps most importantly of all, uh, who could end it uh, if, they, if Russia sought to seek an end to this war today, tomorrow. I'm just wondering if there's any second thought after seeing Lavrov is denying even basic truth. Uh, Alex, we've uh, observed Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, over, the pa over the course of the past year. And I think the Secretary has used the term that the Foreign Minister has an adversarial relationship with the truth. Uh, we didn't engage with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, because we necessarily trust what he has to say or what he has said for that matter. We engaged with Foreign Minister Lavrov just as we've engaged uh, through other channels and through other uh, counterparts uh, because it's in our interest to do so. And again, uh, we are clear-eyed uh, about the potential for any sort of change, near-term change in the Russian posture uh, on this. The point of this brief encounter uh, was not to seek to affect uh, a reversal in the near term over these core uh, issues that matter a great deal to us and to the rest of the world, but uh, it's in our interest to engage in diplomacy uh, and to make clear where the United States stands. I'm prepared to comment on the, that bit of the laughter. What's your response to the fact that, for those of us who were there, uh, that at the beginning of his uh, address at which this thing happened, he actually got a round of applause from that same audience when he talked about how uh, NATO was encro and the West were encroaching on Russia and, and, and going and rise, raising tensions because they're get, they're getting closer. So if you're going to talk about the laughter at that one bit, I'm just wondering what you make of the applause. Uh, well, to, to, to say I was prepared to respond to it, I, he asked a question and I uh, answered it. Uh, well, not that this was I, I don't know. I don't. I'm not suggesting it was pre cooked or anything. Right. But you were you 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 did respond to that. So I'm just wondering if you have any concerns at all that that very same audience also seemed to be sympathetic to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, earlier. Matt, there are misperceptions, uh, and we do our best uh, to counter the misperceptions that are out there, uh, whether they are about the United States, whether they are about our Ukrainian partners, whether they're about NATO. Uh, and we make clear at every opportunity we have uh, that NATO is a defensive alliance, pure and simple. NATO has never threatened anyone that in turn doesn't pose a threat to uh, members of NATO. NATO has uh, expanded uh, as a result of Russian aggression. Uh, and it is incumbent on NATO, on the member states as a defensive alliance, to take prudent steps in response to what they're seeing from Russia's very own actions. The Secretary, almost every opportunity he gets, makes the point that uh, President Putin, who um, I think has uh, done a great deal to not only unite NATO, uh, NATO is now stronger, it is more purposeful, uh, it is more determined, uh, but more broadly than that, President Putin has precipitated just about everything he has sought to prevent, and this goes back to 2014. Uh, whether you look at popular opinion of NATO in a place like Ukraine, whether you look at uh, the Wales commitments that resulted from uh, President Putin's aggressive action in eastern Ukraine, his attempts to seize Crimea in 2014, the defense, the increase in defense spending uh, that we've seen uh, in the aftermath of Wales, and now in the aspirations of uh, two additional European countries to join uh, the world's uh, strongest defensive 
alliance. Okay, fair enough. But <clears throat> you seem to be pleased by the fact that people laughed at him when he made this statement about. Uh, uh, Matt, I, I was I was simply responding to a question. I, I know, but. I, I get that, so I'm asking you another question. I mean, does it not cause you any concern that the same audience was receptive to his argument that you reject, obviously, but I mean, we're talking about an audience of highly educated people in India, non-aligned country, country with which you are working to increase opposition to uh, the Russian action, or the, the Russian war in Ukraine, and yet they seemed sympathetic not to the idea that Russia was attacked, but that somehow Russia was provoked or is threatened. Is Matt, that I, not a cause I, for concern? I, I think I told you at the outset that we have our work cut out for us. Okay. Uh, it is a task that we have, that NATO has, uh, and that our allies and partners more broadly have to combat misinformation, to combat disinformation. We know uh, that Russia is sowing disinformation, is sowing lies about the strategic intent uh, of NATO. We believe the best antidote to disinformation and misinformation is information. It's why we get up here and brief every day. It's why the Secretary brings uh, reporters with him everywhere he travels. It's why we do press avails uh, in uh, when he's traveling, especially in uh, within our emerging partners. All of that is, is part, and part, part and parcel say, of it. Would you say the same about China? Would I say what about China? About promoting disinformation of trying to. I would. And just you would. That's it. Of course, we have seen Russia and the PRC peddle misinformation and disinformation. Okay. Yes, Said. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, on the issue of diplomacy, I, I know that uh, the new American ambassador, Lynn Tracy, only submitted her credentials a couple of months ago and so on. Uh, are there any, uh, so if she met with Russian officials and so on, but has uh, Ambassador uh, Antonov been meeting with anyone uh, in the State Department? Has he met with like the Secretary of State or the Under Secretary of State? Well, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be within protocol for uh, the Russian ambassador to meet with the Secretary of State. That's not his natural counterpart. But yes, uh, without going into details of these engagements, Ambassador Antonov uh, has had contact, including recent contact, including in-person contact uh, with uh, appropriate State Department officials. I ask this because I think uh, last month he said he has not met with any American officials in a very, very long time. It may not be to uh, the, the extent uh, and the uh, cadence of that engagement may not be to his liking, uh, but lines of communication remain open. That is of critical importance to us, and Ambassador Antonov uh, is one element when it comes to those lines of communication. And, and one quick uh, follow-up. Uh, Secretary Austin said from Jordan yesterday that uh, the fall of Bakhmut is not going to change the course of the war. Can you comment on this? I mean, are, are you guys now prepared that Bakhmut all but has fallen? I'm, I'm not prepared to offer that assessment. Of course, our Ukrainian partners in the first instance are going to have uh, the best tactical uh, battlefield update. Uh, our colleagues at the Department of Defense uh, may speak to that as well. But the sentiment that Secretary Austin was putting forward is exactly right, as you might expect. Uh, this is a, a conflict that, a war, an invasion, I should say, uh, whose contours were set in place on February 24th, February 25th, and the days that followed of last year. It was very clear from the earliest hours of Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, that whenever this ended, it would end in uh, a strategic failure for Russia. Uh, that's because the Ukrainians made very clear uh, in the earliest hours of this conflict that the goals that President Putin sought to pursue, uh, the fall of Ukraine, the fall of its government, uh, the subjugation of its people, the erasure of its identity, the <clears throat> essentially the subjugation of the country itself uh, would not be in the cards. And so yes, we have been very clear that there are going to be tough days ahead. Uh, fighting, while it has uh, lulled somewhat during uh, the winter months, it has continued to, ra to rage. Uh, especially in the East, especially in the South. Uh, there have been incremental gains by both sides. We expect that uh, dynamic to continue. The only reason a town like Bakhmut, which I believe, as Secretary Austin said, holds very little strategic import, is in the news, is in the headlines, uh, is because the Russians have nothing else to point to over the course of more than 12 months of a brutal invasion of their own brutal aggression. Uh, were the Russians 
in any had 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 they had any uh, sort of success in this effort, uh, the fall or the fact that a place like Bakhmut is being contested uh, wouldn't even register halfway around the world. The fact that it is the pe the fact that people are focused on it is because the Russians have uh, nothing to point to during the course of uh, their 12 months of brutal aggression uh, against the Ukrainians. Uh, the Ukrainians are, as they have across the country, making a, a valiant effort. Uh, the broader strategic tide of uh, this invasion, we think, is set in stone. Uh, this will be a strategic failure uh, for Russia. Uh, the Ukrainians have demonstrated that they are in a position not only to withstand uh, advancing Russian forces, but uh, to take back territory that has been wrested away from them. That won't change. Uh, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, regarding the, I'm sorry, uh, regarding the South Korea and the Japan uh, did make a decision on uh, historic uh, resolutions. Many Koreans still do not agree on the solution of history between South Korea and Japan. And this is because Japan has not formally apologized. How do you view on this? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, we heartily welcomed uh, the announcement between these two allies of ours, Japan and the ROK. Uh, these issues of history are difficult, they are complex, they are complicated, uh, but both uh, President Yoon, Prime Minister Kishida, have demonstrated bold vision. Uh, they have demonstrated courageous leadership uh, by taking this step forward. Um, the United States is uh, an ally to both of these countries. Uh, we have rock solid, we have a rock solid bilateral relationship with both Japan and the ROK. Uh, we have sought from the earliest moments of this administration uh, to deepen and to advance the trilateral uh, relationship. And I spoke a moment ago to some of the metrics that speak to that, uh, some 25 trilateral engagements several on the part of Secretary Blinken and his ministerial counterparts, several on the part of Deputy Secretary Sherman and her counterparts, Sung Kim and his counterparts, in person, over the phone, uh, as well, of course, uh, with the leader, le leader level engagements that President Biden has uh, taken part in as well. And we're doing that because the trilateral relationship is critical to a vision we share with both countries for a free and open Indo-Pacific. You can talk about it in terms of specific issues, in terms of the importance of trilateral cooperation on the challenges that are posed by the DPRK, uh, but it's also in some ways broader than that. And these are countries with whom we share interests, we share values, and at the crux of both those interests and those values uh, is that very same vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. So, we very much welcome the step forward that uh, Japan and the ROK announced uh, today, and the United States is going to continue to be a partner uh, to do what we can to uh, help these countries as they continue to take additional steps. Do you, th do, do, do you think uh, uh, Japanese should be uh, apologized to uh, victims, the, the, not, these, not a government? These are not questions for the United States uh, to answer. These are discussions that uh, Japan and the ROK, our dear allies, are, ha are having uh, between themselves. That is the appropriate forum for these questions. One more. Uh, sure. the South Korean National Security Advisor Kim Song Han mm -hmm. and uh, Secretary Blinken are meeting today. Why did the National Security Advisor Kim suddenly visit to U.S. and uh, what topic will they be talking about? I don't know that it was a sudden visit. I think this visit has been on the on the books for uh, some time. Of course, it does come on a historic day uh, in the context of our relationship with the ROK and with uh, Japan as well. Uh, they'll discuss a number of issues. They're going to discuss how our two countries can continue to work together collaboratively uh, to support our partners uh, in Ukraine, to ensure our country's uh, economic security and economic prosperity. Uh, the Secretary, of course, will welcome the announcement between uh, the ROK and Japan that we've been uh, speaking to. 
uh, and he will reinforce uh, our commitment to extended deterrence in the face of the DPRK threat. I do expect that we'll have additional details uh, after the meeting today, and we'll be sure to, sure to share that. Uh, they are going to talking about the semiconductor law also? We will have additional details uh, after after the meeting, and, and we'll be sure to share those. Leon, did you have a follow-up? Uh, I, I, I did, but uh, you answered okay. it before. You Great. didn't answer, but. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll move forward then. Shannon. Yeah. Uh, Turkey reportedly summoned Ambassador Flake uh, to express their discontent over General Milley's visit to Syria over the weekend. Do you have any comment on this? And it, do you feel that any unease on Turkey's part is merited here? We can confirm that Ambassador Flake did go to the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs today for meetings and for discussions. Uh, of course, when it comes to General Milley's visit, we'd refer you to the Department of Defense. However, uh, it's our understanding that General Milley met only with U.S. troops while in Syria. Uh, it was only an interaction with uh, American service members. Can I have a follow-up on, follow on that? Sure. Same, same sure. <clears throat> what we just said that he was only there to meet with U.S. Um, officials, mm -hmm. that is disputed by media that is close to the SDF, by PG, and they are saying that he did indeed meet with Mazlum Abdi, the um, head of the SDF. So can you please put it into context for me, because uh, we know that the United States ambassador was summoned to the Turkish Foreign Ministry to give an explanation, quote unquote, uh, by the um, Turkish state agency. So the US Army chief travels to an area controlled by the YPG PKK, and they are headed, the SDF is headed by someone who we all know comes from PKK ranks, and he ordered the killings of Turkish and Kurdish civilians, mm -hmm. as well as NATO soldiers. So just the optics of it, the U.S. Army chief that just doesn't pop up anywhere around the world. So what is really the explanation for the visit? The U.S. Army chief, and again, I'm not the Pentagon spokesperson, so I'm not going to wade too far into this, but the U.S. Army chief uh, does pop up around the world to visit with U.S. service members. Uh, that's what he did in this context. Uh, our service members are deployed in Syria. Uh, in service of a goal that we share with Turkey, as well as with our other allies, as well as with all members uh, of the Global Coalition to uh, defeat ISIS. Uh, our service members in Syria serve one function and only one function. Uh, that is to see to it that the enduring defeat uh, of ISIS is uh, cemented uh, and that ISIS is enabled to regain a pivotal foothold that they once had in places like uh, Syria, in places like Iraq. This is a goal that serves our interests, it serves Turkey's interests, uh, it serves the interests of every single member of the global co coalition to defeat ISIS. There are now dozens uh, of countries around the world that are uh, part of this mission. So, uh, no, it is not unusual for uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to uh, visit with U.S. service members who are deployed, uh, in many cases uh, deployed in harm's way, uh, potentially, and making sacrifices on behalf of uh, their fellow Americans, but uh, also on behalf of people around the world. If, if he's made the travel all the way there, and you made it really clear that he only met with U.S. officials, so if there's no problem with the fact that he can be seen in the same photograph with SDF officials, why didn't that happen? So he wasn't welcomed by the SDF there in that area that was controlled, that is controlled by the YPG SDF. These, these are questions for the Department of Defense. It's our understanding that he met only with U.S. troops while in Syria. Kobani and that area where he visited, on, you know, the, the, the area under the uh, the control of the, the democratic uh, Kurdish forces and so on. <coughs> you can, you still consider that to be part of Syria, correct? correct. Part of Syria that you recognize. Correct. Did the did the the uh, the head of the chairman get a visa to go there from Syria? <laughs> it's, I'm, 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 it's a it's an honest question. I mean, uh, you know. Said, if that's a serious question, I would encourage you to, to talk to the go, Department of Defense. That, if that area, if you still recognize that area as being part of Syria, you know, the, the top military leader in the United States of America, he goes there in and out without, without consulting with that government, without doing anything, correct? Said, I would refer you to the Department of Defense if that is, in fact, a serious question. Yes. Thanks so much. Secretary Blinken is meeting Lithuanian foreign minister today. What would you say, at least in principle, what are the most important points of this meeting? Uh, so we uh, will have a, a um, fairly robust readout uh, coming out of this meeting with our Lithuanian counterparts. But um, Lithuania is a, a critical ally of the United States. Uh, we share uh, goals, of course, uh, and interests as members of NATO. Uh, we share uh, a number of economic interests. Lithuania, for its part, has uh, demonstrated uh, tremendous 
leadership and beyond that resilience in the face of the campaign of coercion that Lithuania has endured and uh, of course withstood uh, from the PRC over the course of the past year. Uh, so we'll have uh, a pretty robust readout to, to offer in the aftermath of this meeting, but uh, it's important for Secretary Blinken to sit down with his uh, Lithuanian counterpart uh, to discuss these shared interests, to discuss the values that unite our two countries, uh, and really to commit Lithuania for the leadership uh, and resilience that it has demonstrated uh, across the board. Uh, yeah, or, uh, uh, Leon, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was wondering, the Secretary is also meeting a senior Israeli official today. Mm -hmm. And uh, this comes uh, after the trip of the head of the IAEA in Tehran mm -hmm. and came back and said there was progress in the negotiations of cameras uh, and so forth. Um, so what is the U.S.'s assessment of uh, Rossi's trip to Iran and where do you stand on potentially uh, introducing a res resolution or not during this uh, Council of Meetings in, uh, in Vienna? Sure. So first, on the visit of the Director General to Tehran over the weekend, we welcome uh, and appreciate the efforts of the IAEA Director General Grossi to engage uh, on the importance of resolving longstanding questions related to Iran's safeguards, obligations, and on other matters related to its nuclear program. In the joint statement that was announced on March 4th between uh, Iran and the IAEA, uh, Iran committed to take important steps and expressed a readiness to provide long overdue cooperation with the agency on the outstanding uh, safeguards issues. We expect, most importantly, Iran to take prompt and concrete action in line with the joint statement. Uh, too many times in the past, we've seen Iran issue vague promises uh, only never to follow through. We in the IAEA Board of Governors have been clear that Iran must cooperate with the IAEA fully and without delay. Uh, and we look forward to additional reporting from the IAEA in the coming weeks uh, on the steps taken uh, by Iran. When it comes to the meeting of the Board uh, of Governors, uh, of course, Iran will be a topic at the Board of Governors. We're uh, engaged with our European allies. Uh, we're also engaged with the IAEA itself uh, on the most effective means by which to uh, see to it that Iran is held to the commitments that it has made. Uh, yes, go ahead. On the Americans kidnapped in Mexico, the Mexican president said that they have information that the Americans crossed the border to buy medicines in Mexico, and then they were detained after a confrontation between groups. I've seen other reporting that said a U.S. official said that uh, they had traveled to the border city for medical procedures, citing receipts found. Can you just clarify the, you know, confirming either the Mexican president's comments or? or what can you tell us of what's been circulating? I, I've seen these same reports. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to confirm any of them, uh, in part because this is an active investigation. The FBI is working very closely with Mexican counterparts uh, in an effort to safely recover these, these Americans. So we wouldn't want to get ahead of that investigation um, to the extent we uh, do, know, do know details, um, but details are also quite scant at this time. But you wouldn't refute what the Mexican president... I, I'm just not going to, to, to weigh in. Uh, I've seen those same reports. And then one, one quick follow-up. I know you said you don't want to uh, say too much, but are, is the State Department aware of a uh, video that's been circulating online showing a white uh, van with um, people getting put into the van. There's been a lot of photos and videos circulating online. I'm just wondering if authorities are at least looking into that, um, if you can kind of confirm whether those are authentic leads in this incident. Uh, these are questions about an ongoing law enforcement investigation. Certainly, we're not going to comment on uh, any uh, active leads. I believe the FBI has issued a statement where they have put out some details uh, of the vehicle in which these individuals were traveling. But again, we'll have to refer to the FBI on those questions. Yes. Following up on that, um, if there's any more information that you have or who carried this out, what is being done to get them home safely, and does this put more pressure to label cartels terrorist groups if this indeed is an act by the cartels? Uh, so these are questions, again, that uh, are about an ongoing investigation, uh, and especially when an on ongoing investigation has the ultimate goal of safely recovering uh, Americans who have been abducted. We don't want to say anything or do anything uh, that could impair the ability of our counterparts in the FBI or other uh, departments and agencies to safely carry out uh, their, their mission. On top of that, uh, information is uh, scant at this point, so we're just not going to, not going to weigh in. Uh, yes, in the back. Thank you so much. 
I want to follow up on the announcement between ROK and Japan. The US has emphasized the importance of trilateral relationship among US, ROK, Japan many times. And on this historical forced labor issue specifically, what kind of advice did the US give to ROK before this announcement? So what kind of role did the US play in this announcement? The United States has played the role of ally. The United States has played the role of partner to both countries. These are decisions that Japan and the ROK uh, have had to make and will have to make uh, themselves. Uh, of course, we are going to play uh, whatever role we can to be most helpful, as helpful as we can, uh, to our treaty allies. But uh, these are decisions that the countries themselves uh, have had to uh, decide to pursue. And when it comes to the decision uh, that was announced today, it is something that uh, we heartily commit uh, because uh, we welcome the uh, advancement of the bilateral relationship between the ROK and Japan, but uh, it's also critically important to us that the trilateral relationship between Japan, between the ROK and the United States is as deep and effective and seamless uh, as it possibly can be, not only for uh, the core challenge that is the DPRK and its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile uh, programs, uh, but also for the shared vision our three countries have uh, of a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Kyla? Sure. Um, there's a Financial Times report that Speaker McCarthy has been convinced by the um, Taiwan government to actually meet with their president in California instead of Taiwan um, due to concerns about a Chinese aggressive response to that visit. Has the State Department been involved in discussions about planning of that um, meeting between the two? Uh, so first, I'm not aware of any confirmed travel on the part of President Tsai to the United States. I'm specifically not aware that our uh, Taiwanese partners uh, have announced uh, any any travel. So I would need to refer you to President Tsai's office, uh, to Speaker McCarthy's uh, office for um, any uh, additional details uh, beyond that. But just from like a from a policy um, and planning perspective would this department be involved in those conversations? Uh, Congress is an independent, co-equal branch of government. Uh, members of Congress, uh, the Speaker of the House uh, in a case like this, is going to decide for himself or herself uh, the meeting, the, the nature of the meetings that uh, he or she wishes to, to make. Now, uh, of course, in the conduct of, in the actual travel, uh, of a foreign dignitary uh, to the United States. There would be uh, a role to play for uh, the Department of State, but of course, I'm not aware of any confirmed uh, travel, nor am I aware that uh, our uh, Taiwanese partners have uh, announced any intention to travel. And just while we're on the subject of travel and China, um, after the canceled visit to Beijing last month for the Secretary of State, you guys said that you would look to planning of another visit when the conditions were conducive mm -hmm. to that visit, I believe. Um, are we any closer to getting that on the calendar? What we said in the aftermath of that postponement, uh, we pointed to the meeting between President Biden and President Xi, the meeting they had in Bali uh, in November of, of last year, where there was uh, an expansive uh, agenda on the table. It was an agenda that had different elements, but the crux of that agenda uh, was the priority we place, both of our countries place, in seeking to uh, see to it that uh, competition doesn't veer into conflict. Uh, and our shared efforts to build a floor on the relationship and ultimately to establish guardrails, uh, to see to it that areas that are potentially conflictual uh, don't actually uh, verge into the realm of conflict. Uh, we made the point uh, in the aftermath of the uh, decision to postpone the visit that uh, it wouldn't be that a visit in the aftermath of uh, the high altitude surveillance balloon wouldn't be conducive uh, to an agenda uh, along those lines. Uh, we still have lines of communication with uh, our POC counterparts. We wish we had more and in some ways deeper uh, lines of communication with our uh, POC, PRC counterparts. Uh, but the Secretary, when the time is right, when the conditions are, in fact, conducive uh, to a meeting with his counterparts in the PRC, uh, is prepared to, to travel. Um, this is a decision that we are going to uh, discuss internally with, uh, within the 
department and across the executive branch, uh, but also uh, I expect there will be, continue to be, conversations between the United States and, and our, our PRC counterparts on this. So conditions aren't conducive right now? We haven't announced uh, any plans to, uh, for the Secretary to, to travel uh, in, the, in the near term. Uh, Simon. Let's ask about um, Tunisia. You, you touched on it last week um, in regard to, to the political situation, um, uh, but there's a separate issue. Uh, the World Bank um, has today said that, they're, or yesterday I think in a note said they're going to pause future work with Tunisia over um, the president's uh, statements regarding migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, I wondered if, um, you know, I don't think you've spoken on, on that particular issue, uh, you know, the president's comments and also um, the country's uh, crackdown on, on migrants. Um, you know, I wondered if you had any comment on that and whether we could expect, um, you know, any kind of pause or, or disruption to U.S. aid arrangements uh, to Tunisia. Well, as you heard from uh, the World Bank, we too are deeply concerned by President Saeed's remarks regarding migration from sub-Saharan Africa to Tunisia and reports of arbitrary arrests of migrants in recent weeks. Uh, these remarks are not in keeping with Tunisia's long history of generosity in hosting and protecting refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants, and we're disturbed by reports of violence uh, against these very migrants. We urge Tunisian authorities to meet their obligations under international law to protect the rights of refugees, asylum seekers, uh, and migrants, and we encourage Tunisian authorities to coordinate with international humanitarian organizations to facilitate the safe, dignified, and voluntary return of migrants who wish to return uh, to their, their countries of origin. Alex? And move to the caucus, if you, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you have anything to say about uh, late, latest um, casualties uh, from last night uh, between, uh, it, well, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh territory. Uh, we're following reports of a shooting incident uh, on March 5th inside Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which killed uh, five individuals, we understand. Uh, we offer our condolences to the families of those injured and killed. Uh, there can be no military solution to the conflict, and the use of force to resolve disputes is never acceptable. Uh, the only way to sustain peace at the, is at the negotiating table, and, to you, and the use of force undermines negotiations. Uh, senior advisor for caucuses negotiations, Lou Bono, is in the region to stress the only way forward is through direct dialogue and diplomacy. And as the Secretary has emphasized, the United States is committed uh, to Armenia-Azerbaijan peace negotiations. Any sense of uh, its timing and also its implications for, as you said, the senior advisors in the, is in the region, its implications for, for the negotiation process? Its implications for? For, for, for the peace process. Uh, the implication, uh, the clearest implication for us uh, is the imperative of continued direct dialogue and discussion between the parties themselves. Uh, this is uh, Im imperative on the part uh, of the parties. We have uh, played the role of partner to both countries, facilitating on a trilateral basis uh, engagement between the foreign ministers and between the, at the leader level uh, as well. Uh, we are prepared, whether bilaterally, trilaterally, multilaterally, uh, to continue to be a partner in furtherance uh, of efforts to secure uh, a, a lasting peace. Uh, on that point, uh, as it is uh, heard last week from Lavrov directly when he was traveling uh, in the region, um, uh, that uh, basically it's a fair way to solve the problem if they stick with Russian mediating efforts, something that was reflected by actually his spokesperson later on as well. So I'll give you a chance to make your case why the Western mediation you think is the way to go. This is a question for the parties themselves, uh, and we're not going to um, put ourselves against any other offer of, of mediation. And in fact, uh, we're not a mediator. Uh, we are a partner to the two countries. Uh, I think we have demonstrated both in word and in deed uh, the uh, nature uh, of our relationship with the two countries, our ability uh, to bring the two countries together, our um, willingness and readiness uh, to help bring about additional progress in relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, we are not doing this as a means by which to compete with Moscow. Uh, we are doing this in an effort to bring about uh, the settlement and resolution of a long-standing dispute uh, between these two countries, and unfortunately a dispute uh, that has consistently taken lives, uh, just as it did on March 5th. Uh, our interest here is in peace and security. It's in uh, the interests of the people of Armenia and, and Azerbaijan uh, as well. Said. Thank you. Uh, going on the Palestinian issue, uh, very quickly, the uh, uh, same Sheikh, he's the executive director, I mean, the director of the executive director of the PLO, 
uh, told uh, the Israeli newspaper, the Times of Israel, that uh, Israel has not fulfilled the Aqaba promises to mm -hmm. transfer uh, withheld PA funds. Are you aware of that? Are you, are you aware of this report? And do you have any comments? Uh, Said, I've seen that report. We'd have to refer you to the parties uh, themselves. Generally, our, our point has always been that uh, we and our regional partners will continue to work with the parties to advance the commitments made in Aqaba. Uh, resulting from Aqaba was a, a public st statement that uh, spelled out uh, commitments on the part of uh, the parties. Uh, I'm not aware that the commitment that you referenced was uh, actually in uh, the communique from Aqaba. Okay. Are you, are you satisfied with uh, Israel's fulfillment of all the elements that came in the communique? What, what's, most, what's most important to us, Saeed, is uh, that the parties uh, fulfill the commitments they've made. I don't think we're ever going to be able to render uh, a verdict on whether their work is complete. This is an incomplete project uh, because tensions do remain high. The situation on the ground remains tenuous. And so especially as that's the case, it's imperative that the parties uh, adhere to the commitments that they made to one another, the commitments that they made to the United States, to Jordan, to Egypt as well. These commitments are important in and of themselves, but uh, if and when implemented, these are important commitments that can help to de-escalate tensions, that can help to restore uh, the overriding sense of calm uh, that we and our partners in Egypt, Jordan, and throughout the region uh, would like to see uh, return. Okay, but you know, uh, going back to the uh, Septo attack last Sunday, Sunday the 26th mm -hmm. of February, uh, while it was, you know, uh, shown all over the world and so on. Settler violence continues, I mean, almost every day, and uh, most of the time with the protection of the Israeli army. Uh, so, I don't know, all these communiques and all these talks and so on that you talked to the Israelis or the Palestinians and so on, has not seen, at least till now, you know, a week has elapsed, to really impact or to stop uh, Israel from at least giving cover, the Israeli army giving cover to the to set their violence. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, Saeed, we, we believe it's critical that both parties refrain from unilateral steps that serve only to exacerbate tensions uh, and undercut efforts to advance a negotiated two-state solution. We've been unequivocal uh, in condemning uh, any and all forms of violence. We are agnostic as to the perpetrator. Violence is never appropriate. It is never acceptable. Uh, we condemn it regardless of who's behind it. Is this an issue that you will be discussing this afternoon with uh, Minister Ron Dermer? Uh, Minister Dermer and the National Security Advisor have uh, a portfolio of uh, regional security issues. Uh, I expect the Secretary uh, and the team will uh, have a discussion uh, a broad discussion with uh, their Israeli counterparts on the central uh, regional security issues. Of course, at the top of that list is a challenge that uh, is posed by Iran, uh, its nuclear program, but also uh, the broader set of threats that Iran poses to the region. We'll have more to say in the aftermath of that meeting. And, and lastly, I want to ask uh, on, about the whereabouts of uh, Envoy Hadi Amr. Is he still there? Is he back here? Uh, Hadi Amr was in the region last week. Right. He was in the, the West Bank last week. Uh, I'd have to check to see if he's returned, but we'll let you know. Uh, yeah, Gita. Thanks. Uh, picking up on the reference to Iran, I have a question about the school poisoning. Mm -hmm. It has spread. It has been stopped. And more and more schools are being, um, um, the, the students are being poisoned. Uh, the government is not doing anything about it. Uh, one thing there seems to be doing, one thing that they seem to be doing is preventing the medical profession from giving the parents access to their kids' lab results mm -hmm. or even preventing them from seeing their kids while they're being treated. Um, some officials say this is just stress-related, and some <laughs> others are saying that the girls are doing this themselves. They are doing the what's, what they're, everybody's calling chemical attack. Would you support or even initiate a call for international investigation? So, Gita, first, uh, these reports of continued poisoning of schoolgirls across Iran, uh, they are unconscionable. Uh, these poisonings need to be stopped immediately. Uh, women and girls in Iran, and women and girls everywhere, for that matter, have a universal human right. It is the universal right to education. It's essential uh, to advancing uh, 
uh, economic security, prosperity, realizing their potential, whether that's in Iran uh, or anywhere else. There must be accountability for those responsible for what, what is happening. Uh, to your question, if these poisonings uh, were found to be related to women and girls' participation in protests, then it would be within the mandate of the UN's independent international fact-finding mission on the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, to investigate. Uh, our, our thoughts do remain with uh, all of those who, who are suffering from this. Uh, and to the other element of your question, we are alarmed by what we've seen on the part of Iranian authorities. Uh, the reported arrests of uh, a prominent journalist, Ali uh, Portabatai, for investigating uh, the poisonings. We're also alarmed by reports that Iranian authorities have intimidated parents, that they have intimidated medical professionals into uh, silence. Uh, the entire world is greatly concerned about these poisonings. Uh, Iranian authorities should s cease suppressing the media and allow them to do their jobs. Uh, the same is true for medical professionals. The same is true for parents who are attempting merely to care uh, for their children. Uh, there must be accountability for these poisonings, and most importantly, uh, they must come to an end. Well, the fact-finding mission's uh, mandate is, is long. How about, I don't know, the WHO or um, the International Red Cross? Would, would, would it be possible? Would you call for that? Do you think that's something that would be more credible than the government itself um, doing the investigation? Uh, so I'm not going to speak for any uh, other organization that may or may not have, have a role in this. But uh, there is a, uh, a fact-finding mechanism within the UN itself. It was a fact-finding mechanism uh, within the auspices uh, of uh, the, uh, a, an existing UN body, uh, if it is determined that uh, there was uh, a motive at play in an effort to um, suppress uh, the ambitions, the abilities of women and girls in Iran, we do think it would be uh, appropriate for that particular body uh, to, uh, within, the, within their mandate, to investigate. Well, how, do you, how do you determine that the motive that Presumably, you don't trust any Iranian investigation. So uh, how, how do you get to the point where you can say that, okay, this now falls within the purview of the... So the, so the world, Matt, is watching very closely. Uh, and we are, even in the midst of Iranian attempts to intimidate and to suppress uh, information that is reaching the rest of the world, uh, we've been able to see these reports. We've been able to see video. We've been right. able to uh, hear firsthand accounts. Uh, I think it will uh, become clear to the world what is or what, what is not happening. Uh, if that information continues to uh, emanate from Iran, uh, we'll continue to watch very closely and we'll continue to call for uh, what's appropriate but, and effective. But you haven't, based on what's come out so far, you have not been able to assign motive. That's right. What makes you think that, I mean, this has been going on for some time now. That's right. So you're confident that without an international investigation or an international fact-finding mission or something like that that could get inside Iran and look to see what a motive might be or was, is, uh, you can you can determine that anyway? Uh, we've been able to see with our own eyes through news reports, through reports that are uh, emanating from Iran, uh, video footage of this as well. I suspect we'll continue to learn more about this if uh, these, unfortunately, continue. Uh, we want to do what is most effective, uh, what we think uh, will help to uh, address, that will come to the aid of uh, women and girls who's been uh, subjected to this. Most importantly, uh, these reported poisonings need to come to an end. Do you have any, any comment on that? We've seen these reports of attempted uh, suppression on the part of those who are reporting on this. We've seen reports as well uh, that they, those who may have been subjected uh, to uh, what is afflicting uh, these girls in Iran may also have been intimidated uh, and the subject of repression themselves. Of course, all of this is, is greatly concerning for us. Yes? Yeah, the, the foreign minister, in Iran spokesman today said, uh, his country is still exchanging message with Washington, and he expressed uh, commitment to diplomacy, as he said, to resolve the uh, differences and the uh, nuclear uh, uh, negotiation uh, issue. 
Uh, can you can you confirm that about the message and wh wh what's your comment? Uh, why did he? Uh, why? Wh how do you read it? I haven't seen the the full context of these remarks, but what I can tell you is that uh, we have heard plenty of misleading and outright uh, misleading statements and outright lies from Iranian officials over the course of weeks now. The JCPOA is not on the agenda and has not been on the agenda for some time. Uh, what has been on the agenda are uh, three primary uh, topics, the violence and the repression, uh, the efforts on the part of the Iranian regime to suppress its own people, uh, Iran's provision of UAV technology uh, to, uh, to Russia, uh, and then, of course, Iran's continued practice of wrongfully detaining uh, Americans in Iran. Uh, we have means by which to make our positions and to uh, make clear our, the priority we attach uh, to each of those issues, but we're just not going to speak to uh, the particular channels. S yes. So you, you're denying that you're exchanging messages with Tehran with respect to the nuclear negotiations? The, the, the JCPOA is not on the agenda, yes. Uh, I also want to follow up on South Korea-Japan agreement uh, about the wartime labor issue. In the wake of this agreement, Japanese mm -hmm. government said it would uh, start a process to lift uh, restriction on the semiconductor material export to ROK. So do you uh, support this movement uh, as you seek a stronger uh, supply chain among US allies? These are questions for the governments of the ROK in Japan themselves. Uh, we support any effort that seeks to improve and to advance the relationship uh, between our allies, the ROK and Japan, because that in turn uh, supports the trilateral relationship that we have cultivated and we have focused on to such a great detail uh, uh, to such a great detail uh, over the course of this administration. I should say for Secretary Blinken himself, uh, this is something that has been a focus of his for even longer than that when he was Deputy Secretary of State uh, in the final two years of the Obama Biden administration. This was uh, a priority of his to cultivate uh, and seek to support better relations between these two treaty allies. We have uh, come a, a ways from where we were 10 years ago. Today's step uh, is a, a very positive development, one we heartily commend, uh, and we hope to see our treaty allies continue to build on this going forward. Yeah. Two questions on Russia. Thank you. The United States refused to issue visas to Russian diplomats who were heading to New York this week for an event at the United Nations. Do you have any comment here? Uh, I don't. If we uh, <laughs> if we have anything to offer on that, uh, we will. Okay. And one more question: The New Start Treaty, mm -hmm. as you know, expires in, th in in less than three years. Mm -hmm. Should Washington and Moscow fail to agree on uh, on extension in February 2026? Are there any contingency planning you're doing now for this scenario, or are you planning anything? For this case? Thank I think your question gets far ahead of where we are, and I say that because uh, Moscow has announced its purported sp suspension uh, of implementation of the New START agreement. Uh, even before that happened, we found that Moscow was in technical noncompliance uh, with the New START treaty. So before we start talking about what happens in 2026 and a potential uh, renewal of uh, the New START treaty, uh, we want to focus on bringing Moscow back into compliance with the treaty. It is in the interests of the American people. It is in the interests of the people of Russia. It's in the interests of people around the world to see to it that uh, the two countries that possess the largest number of nuclear weapons engage in responsible behavior. And part of being a responsible nuclear power is engaging in arms control. It's engaging in talks about strategic stability, just as the United States and the Soviet Union did over the course of the Cold War. Uh, over the course of the Cold War, we had mechanisms in place to mitigate against uh, the possibility that there would be a nuclear exchange. Ultimately, these efforts were successful uh, in that there was not a nuclear exchange between nuclear powers during the Cold War. Now, uh, the responsibility we have as nuclear powers, the United States and Russia, uh, is just as great. It's incumbent upon countries that uh, seek to be responsible stakeholders in the international community to act responsibly. Uh, we have consistently acted responsibly. Late last year, we thought we would soon be meeting with our Russian counterparts in Cairo uh, for a meeting of the uh, Bilateral Consultative uh, Commission to discuss 
uh, issues of New Start implementation and compliance. Uh, Russia, unfortunately, pulled out of that engagement. Earlier this year, we thought there would be a meeting of the BCC. Russia, unfortunately, pulled out of that. And that is what ultimately led us to render uh, Russia not in technical compliance with the New Start agreement. But uh, there is uh, a very um, uncomplicated way for Russia to come back into compliance. It needs to take part in inspections. That's something that can happen fairly quickly, and it's something that we hope uh, Moscow does for the sake of its citizens, for the sake of our citizens, for the sake of people around the world. Last question on Syria, on general military travel to Syria. Did the U.S. notify Russia in any way about the travel? This is a question for DOD, I, I couldn't say. Okay, uh, okay. thanks everyone. Thank